Holy Spirit, not only are you welcome here, you are desperately needed here. And we thank you, Lord, for your promise that where two or three are gathered, you are there in our midst. So thank you, Heavenly Father. You meet with us. We are here corporately and collectively today to worship you. And thank you, Lord, for the worship that has already taken place. And Father, it's my prayer as we read Scripture together that you would illuminate every word. And Father, I'm reminded that the Word of God never comes back void, always fulfilling its intended purpose. So, Lord, may your purpose be completed today in the ears of my brothers and sisters and those who are visiting, those who do not know you, Lord. I pray for them. Oh, Lord, plant seeds in their life today, Lord God. But, Lord, again, you be exalted now. We thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Go ahead and grab a seat. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Dan. I'm an elder here at Cornerstone Church, and um, thank you for coming today. Um, I got saved in 1985. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. God took me out of the sin that I was living in, and he saved me. He brought me into his marvelous light out of the darkness. And I remember, as a brand new Christian, a particular verse in the Bible that I have never forgotten. And it's Proverbs 14.34, and it says, Righteousness exalts a nation. But sin is a disgrace to any people. Now remember my pastor, Lester Ayers at Northport Baptist Church, the first church I started going to when I got saved, teaching on that. And we use that verse as we engage the culture. Because even back then in 1985, there were several issues facing our culture that the church had to stand up and take a stand on. And we go fast forward 30 years and some of those same issues are now even more prevalent to us in our society today. A short 30 years later, back in 1985, it seemed like society stood on the side of the church. Not so much today. 2016. In fact, just this week, I read an article where a Republican senator, for, a congressman from the state of Georgia, was in a meeting with other Republicans discussing policy, and he quoted biblical verses on proper lifestyles. And his fellow Republicans walked out in disgust that he would bring the Bible into a meeting. And it, and, it, and it just pierces my heart to know that these are the leaders of our country. Well, if your faith is in the Republican Party, oh my goodness, I feel sad for you. If your faith is in the Democratic Party, I feel sorry for you. Because our faith needs to be in God and God alone. Do we want godly leaders? Absolutely. Because righteousness exalts a nation. Shame on the nation that shuns righteousness and exalts sin. You want to live in a country that exalts sin? What God says is right, we say is wrong. And what we say is right, God says is wrong. It's pretty sad. But when we look at Hezekiah, which we're going to be looking at today, and this is the beauty of the scripture, we have to trust that the word of God is accurate because when we read this historical account of, of, of Hezekiah, which was 700 years before the birth of Christ, so we're talking roughly 27 to 3,000 years ago. But is the word of God true yesterday, today, and forever? Amen, right? So we know that even though 700 years or maybe 900 years ago, when the psalmist said, or in the Proverbs, Solomon said, hey, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. Is that true today? Is it? You alive? Absolutely. It's true today, right? Hezekiah lived in a time where sin was rampant. He lived in a culture that did not love God or the things of God. I'm going to bring into a quick two or three minute overview of the history of where Hezekiah finds himself. You remember Jeff Abney taught on unity a few weeks ago? Solomon died. His son, Rehoboam, went to seek counsel. Remember that story? And he got the older guys, the elders of the land, and he sought counsel from them. And they said, hey, do this. And then he went to the younger people, the people his age, in his youthful arrogance. 
And they said, no, do this. Instead of following the elders, he followed his youth friends who had absolutely no wisdom whatsoever. So basically, the tribes were in this battle because Solomon, at the end of his life, was, 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 was just burdening, bur burdensome on taxes on the people. And there was a division because his son said, hey, if you think it was bad under my dad, wait, till I, wait, wait now that I'm king, it's going to be even worse. So ten tribes said, no way. And they went up to the north, known as Israel, the northern kingdom. This was right after Solomon died in 931 B.C. Two tribes to the south, the tribe of Benjamin and the tribe of Judah, went south. And Rehoboam was their king. Jeroboam was the king in the northern kingdom. So the northern kingdom... 200 years later, there it is, the red is the northern kingdom, Israel, 10 tribes, the southern kingdom, Judah, Benjamin, and the tribe of Judah. Northern kingdom, we fast forward 200 years to the time of Hezekiah, had 19 kings. How many good kings did the northern kingdom have in 200 years? Zero. Zero. How sad, right? 19 kings, not one godly king. Southern Kingdom, Judah, a few good kings. If I remember correctly, we had about four godly kings in the 200 year time period of when Hezekiah comes on the scene. He comes on the scene around 700 BC. So there's the scenario. You have the Northern, Northern Kingdom, Southern Kingdom, and they don't like each other. In fact, the Northern Kingdom had alliances with Syria to go to war with the Southern Kingdom. How sad is that? That God's people were at civil war with each other. It's pretty sad. Turn your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 1. Gives you an idea of, of, of the culture that this guy Hezekiah lived in. I'm going to start with verse 4 and read through verse 6. So, this is the prophet Isaiah, one of my favorite prophets in all of Scripture. He says, Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. Why will you still be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel, to rebel? The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but bruises and sores and raw wounds. They are not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. This was the culture that Hezekiah finds himself living in. And when Isaiah says, there's no softening with oil, what he's saying is there's no relief. Why? Because there's no repentance. This culture refused to repent. And if they repented, they would have, God would have brought relief. In fact, the scripture says in Proverbs 28, 13, and this is for us today. Keep this in mind. Whoever conceals his transgressions shall not prosper. But he who confesses and forsakes them will find mercy. Thank you, Jesus, right? But this culture refused, absolutely refused. All right, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 12. When we think of righteousness exalts a nation, sin is a disgrace to any people. My first point of my message today is that sin leads to discipline. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, I'm going to start reading at verse 29, because God is telling the people what to do, and he's telling the people what not to do. And this is what he says. He says in verse 29 of Deuteronomy 12, he says, When the Lord your God cuts off before you the nations whom you go in to dispossess, and you dispossess them and dwell in their land, take care that you not be ensnared to follow them after they have been destroyed before you. 
and that you do not inquire about their God, saying, how did these nations serve their gods? That I also may do the same. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. For every abominable thing that the Lord hates, they have done for their gods. For they even burn their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Everything that I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to it or take from it. Flip a few pages to 16. Verse 21 and 22 says, You shall not plant any tree as an Asherah beside the altar of the Lord your God that you should make. And you shall not set up a pillar which the Lord your God hates. So, so the instructions are there for the, for the people of God. Now let's go to our text today, 2 Kings. And let's see just how good of a job the people of God did in following God's commands. 2 Kings. I'm going to start in chapter 17, verse 7. 17:7. 17, 7. You're welcome. And this occurred because the people of Israel had sinned against the Lord, their God, who brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods. They walked in the customs of the nations whom the Lord God drove out before the people of Israel and in the customs that the kings of Israel had practiced. And the people of Israel did secretly against the Lord their God things that were not right. They built for themselves high places in their towns, from watchtower to fortified city. They set up for themselves pillars and ashram on every high hill and under every green tree. Did we just not read what God told them not to do? And they're doing it. And they made offerings on all the high places as the nations did whom the Lord carried away before them. And they did wicked things provoking the Lord to anger. And they served idols of which the Lord had said to them, You shall not do this. Yet the Lord warned Israel and Judah by prophet and seer, saying, Turn away from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes in accordance with all the law that I commanded your fathers. And that I sent to you by my brother, by my servants, the prophets. And verse 14 says, but they would not listen. They were stubborn as their fathers had been who did not believe in the Lord their God. Now I have a question for some of you that, um, and, 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 and this is important, otherwise I wouldn't say it. God gave loving warnings to those who persisted in their sin through the prophets. And I know some of you guys that come here and some of you ladies who come here, and I don't, understand my heart, I don't say this in any other way other than the fact that I care for you. You come here week after week after week and you hear the Word of God. And through the Word of God is loving warnings that your sin is keeping you away from God. So for some of you, and you know who you are, I know some of you, and there's some of you who I don't know. But if that's you, you need to get on your knees and repent before God. Each week, the warnings come. Each week, the love comes. Each week, the truth from the Scripture comes. God is real. Sin needs to be forgiven only through the blood of Jesus Christ. If you're trusting in any other thing, it's a road to destruction. Now, I also want to speak to you who profess Christ as Savior. Do we have instruction? In fact, do we have more than they had back in the Old Testament? Yes, we have it complete right here, right? We have the instructions. So my question to my brothers and sisters in Christ, are we following the instructions? In other words, am I loving my wife according to the scriptures? Hmm? Spouses, are you treating your husband with respect? Are you following the scriptures? Children, the Bible says, honor your mother and your father. Are you honoring your mother and your father? So, 
So we have the instructions, and I, and I just urge you guys to do an honest reflection in your life and make sure you're in the Word of God every day. Every single day, you're in the Word of God. So let me just go into Hebrews chapter 12. I'd like you guys to turn there, Hebrews chapter 12. Because there is a purpose of discipline. I don't want to skip over this point and not address why God disciplines His children. Hebrews chapter 12. In Proverbs 3, 11 and 12, it says, My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves, even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. Now, when I corrected my son and my daughters when they were little, I'm the dad who kind of let them put a pillow over there before I would spank them. Probably not a good idea. Didn't get the point, of course, very good. I think they preferred to get whooped by their dad rather than their mother. And that's how it was in my house, too. When, when I sinned as a kid, and when I came home getting caught doing things I didn't, well, I shouldn't have been doing, it was my dad who I went to. And my dad said, don't do it again. If your mother finds out, whew. Not a godly response at all. But when my mom found out, oh boy, oh boy, it was, it was nasty. But she kept me on the straight and narrow, I'll tell you that. God can, God can take good out of any situation. That's, that's the God that we serve. But Hebrews, in chapter 12, I'm going to start with verse 5 and read through verse 11. And he says, and have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? And this is uh, Proverbs 3 that I just read. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when he reproves you. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short, a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness." For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Now, Doug often holds up the Bible and he says, Hey, is God really interested in your happiness? Right? Is he? Not so much. But is he interested in your holiness? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what verse 10 says. So that we may share his holiness. That's the purpose of discipline. To get us back to repentance, restore our proper fellowship with God, and that he would then conform and burn a brighter image of Christ into our lives. So kids, don't, don't shun the, the, the discipline of your parents. Don't shun it. it it's, it's, if it's done biblically, it is done for your good, ultimately so that you would share in the holiness of Almighty God. All right. So I, I, I have to say that this is, uh, from a national perspective, sin is a disgrace to any people. And I love to narrow it down into my own family too. Is my own family walking in righteousness or are we exalting sin in our lives? So the question of the day, are you, like Hezekiah, holding fast to the Lord in difficult times, tumultuous times? So point two on the connecting point. Keys to godly leadership. What are the keys to godly leadership? Hezekiah is a great example. Let's go back to 2 Kings chapter 18. When Kathy and I first moved to 
this beautiful state of Arizona, we went to a church up in North Phoenix. Good church, preached the gospel. God called us out of there after about a year or two. For nothing bad reason, he just called us out. But I would meet once, one day a week at the church with about three or four other guys, and we would just fellowship. One day, the pastor there, a guy named Bob Claycamp, he never came to this meeting. He just couldn't sleep one night, so he came. So, he, so with the four or five other guys, he, he sat down and he said something I will never forget. We were talking about prayer. And he said three words. He said, pray and go. Pray and go. I'll never forget it. James tells us, right, that faith without actions is what? Dead, right? Dead. But I'll never, pray and go. How simple, but how true, at least in my opinion. You're going to pray and go. And Hezekiah was a man who prayed and went. He prayed and he goes. He was a man of action, in other words. It says in chapter 18, in the third year of Hosea, king of Elah, king of Israel. So that's the northern kingdom. Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he begins to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His, no his mother's name was Abai, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David, his father, had done. That verse 3 is, is a breath of fresh air, because if you read through the 1 Kings and 2 Kings, typically it says, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So finally, we come to a godly king who says he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And this is what he does. He removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah. And he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept the commandments that the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him. Wherever he went out, he prospered. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and would not serve him. Yeah, he wouldn't serve the king of Assyria. What does Paul tell us in Galatians 1? If we're trying to please man, are we servants of God? Are we? If our desire is to please man, we're not, we're not servants of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul says in Galatians chapter 1. If you desire to please man, you will eventually fear man. Because I'll tell you, you can't please man all the time. You can please him a little bit, they'll want more and more and more. And eventually your whole being will be trying to please someone that cannot be pleased. That's why Paul says, hey, I'm not here to please man, and I'm not going to fear man. I'm going to fear God and serve God alone. And Hezekiah had the same heart. He wouldn't serve man. He wouldn't bow down to man. But he held fast to the Lord. I love that scripture. Think about this. Hezekiah is literally watching the northern kingdom be destroyed and conquered by Assyria. Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, comes in and he takes literally hostage all the people of the northern kingdom. And Hezekiah is seeing this. And I, part of me wonders, oh my goodness, we need to get right with God. We need to look what's happening to our neighbors to the north due to their sin and due to their idolatry. So he gets rid of all the idolatry in the land. And it's sad to think that all of all the kings in the northern kingdom and all the kings in the southern kingdom, even some of the kings in the southern kingdom that were actually godly kings before him, none of them had the courage to get rid of the Asherah poles. Some of your versions may have said something to the effect of groves. In other words, there were these trees growing and they would carve these images of false gods in the tree called Asherah poles. And God says, no, -uh, you're not supposed to do that. But they did it anyway. But he removes them. And he also takes the bronze servant, the bronze serpent that Moses, you remember that story in Numbers chapter 21? If you want to write it down, I'm not going to go there. But when the people were leaving Egypt and they were going around Edom and they were complaining like they did, it seemed like every single day they were complaining to Moses, we don't like the food. 
Why'd you take us out of Egypt? At least we had food. Why, why are you doing us? We're going to die out here in the wilderness, right? God got so angry, he said, serpents came out. They bit some of the Israelites, and some of the Israelites died. And they said, hey, we sinned, we sinned. Moses, go to God and tell him to get rid of these serpents. And he says to him, build a serpent and put it on a pole. And when they get bit, they can look at the serpent on the pole, and they will be saved. Seven, eight hundred years later, they're worshiping the pole. Thank you. They're worshiping this pole that has a serpent on it. That's how far away they came from God. It was, it was this, you know, and, and I think of some of the religion that I grew up in and maybe some of the other religions in our culture today. We worship relics. Relics. And we think it's okay because it's been around forever. Or a tradition that's been around forever. And yet it might be contrary, contrary to the word of God. Are there any relics in your life that you're worshiping? Thinking, oh, this, this has been worshipped by my parents, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, great-great-great, all the way back thousands of years, perhaps. 700 years, this serpent pole made it. They kept it. And it was part of their worship. They worshipped. They made offerings to it. Do you understand that? A pole. A pole. They forsake the true and living God, and they worship a pole. The word Nehushtan there, I believe, means a piece of bronze. Let's go over to Second Chronicles. So it's just a few books to your right. Chapter 29. So he removes the idolatry, and he also clean, cleanses and repairs the temple. Anybody know who Hezekiah's dad was? His name was Ahaz, the king before him, and he was an ungodly man, and he's one of the kings where it said he did evil in the sight of the Lord, and he closed the door to the temple, and the scripture says that Ahaz filled the temple with filth, filth. But in 29 of Hezekiah, it says, Hezekiah began to reign when he was 25 years old, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. Let me skip to verse 3. In the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. He brought in the priests and the Levites and assembled them in the square on the east. And he said to them, Hear me, Levites. Consecrate yourselves and consecrate the house of the Lord, the God of your fathers, and carry out the filth from the holy place. For our fathers have been unfaithful and have done what has been evil in the sight of the Lord our God. They have forsaken him and turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord and turned their backs. They also shut the doors of the vestibule and put out the lamps that have not burnt incense or offered burnt offerings in the holy place to the God of Israel. Therefore, the wrath of the Lord come on Judah and Jerusalem. And he has made them an object of horror, of astonishment, of hissing, as you see with your own eyes. Behold, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. Now it is my heart, great verse, my heart to make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, in order that his fierce anger may turn away from us. So he cleanses the temple, he repairs the temple, and it's his own father who was committing these grievous sins against God. But Hezekiah has this heart. For what? For true worship back in the temple. And let's skip down to uh, 2920 where he restores temple worship. Hezekiah the king rose early and gathered the officials of the city and went up to the house of the Lord. And I'm going to skip to verse 30. And Hezekiah the king and the officials commanded the Levites to sing praises to the Lord with the words of David and Aspa the seer. And they sang praises with gladness. They bowed down and worshipped. Then Hezekiah said, you have now consecrated yourselves to the Lord. Come near, bring sacrifices and thank offerings to the house of the Lord. And the assembly brought sacrifices and thank offerings of all who were a willing heart brought burnt offerings. 
The number of the burnt offerings in the assembly brought was 70 bulls, 100 rams, 200 lambs. All these were for a burnt offering to the Lord. And the consecrated offerings were 600 bulls and 300 sheep, 3,000 sheep. But the priests were too few and could not flay all the burnt offerings. So until other priests had consecrated themselves, their, brother, their brothers, the Levites, helped them until the work was finished. For the Levites were more upright in heart than the priests in consecrating themselves. Besides the great number of burnt offerings, there was the fat of the peace offerings. And there were the drink offerings for the burnt offerings. Thus the service of the house of the Lord was restored. Hezekiah restored the proper worship for the Israelites. And Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced because God had provided for the people. And the thing came about suddenly. You see what one leader can do? One man instituting proper godly reform in the culture. And in 31, he restores the Passover. For lack of time, I'm not going to get into that too much right now. I'm going to touch on it at the time of communion. But one amazing thing in chapter 31, I'm sorry, chapter 30. Look at verse 12. It says, the hand of God was also on Judah to give them one heart to do what the king and the princes commanded by the word of the Lord. Hezekiah had this amazing heart for unity. He actually reached his hand out to the northern kingdom, to the remnant that was still left behind after the Assyrians attacked, and invited them to come celebrate the Passover. That's amazing because the north and south didn't like each other. They were at war. And here's Hezekiah saying... Let's reach out. We've restored the temple. We have to have Passover now. Let's invite our brothers from the north so that they can come down and worship the Lord with us at Passover. So he reinstitutes this national holiday as the Passover. It's really, really cool. Second Chronicles 31, 20 and 21 sums it up. Thus Hezekiah did throughout all Judah... And he did what was good and right and faithful before the Lord his God. And every work that he undertook in the service of the house of God. And in accordance with the law and the commandments seeking his God. He did with all his heart. And prospered. And prospered. Let's go back to 2 Kings. Because Hezekiah. His faith is about to be severely tested. Let's go back to 2 Kings. My next point, not only is he a man of action, got rid of the idolatry, cleansed the temple, restored proper worship, true worship to the king. He's a man of prayer. A godly key to leadership is being a man of prayer. Let me set the stage for you here. Chapter 18 of 2 Kings. The Assyrians were arguably... The meanest, vilest, you know what, in the history of man. They were evil. Murderous, evil people. They came and they've already taken the northern kingdom. You can imagine what fear that would put in any man's life when now Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, sends his general down and they ultimately take city after city after city in the southern kingdom of Judah. And they're basically 30 miles outside the walls of Jerusalem. Jerusalem being the capital of the southern kingdom of Judah. So he already took over Samaria in the north. They've already conquered the northern kingdom. And Hezekiah saw it. And now here they come for him. This is the stage of 2 Kings 18. And I don't care who you are. Everybody has fear in their life, right? Raise your hand if you have no fear in your life. There's something that everybody's afraid of. And all fear, perfect love casts out all fear. So when I have these things in my life that I fear, it's because I'm not close to God. Only God can give me the peace that I need in certain things in my life that I struggle with. And the devil likes to bring that up to me just about every second of every day, those things. But when I, when I, but you know, when I, when I look at the scripture, and we look at this historical account of Hezekiah, 
And when I look at our culture today, I can easily get scared. I can easily say, what kind of a world are my kids going to grow up in? And your kids and your kids. When, when we're shifting so far away from the righteousness that used to exalt America, where we're now elevating and exalting sin in our lives, what kind of, what kind of world are our kids going to live in? And I, I get scared. But then when I read Hezekiah, who's, who right now is my, like my best friend in all of Scripture, I'm reminded that God is in control. He's in control of all things. And Hezekiah has this evil army right outside his doorsteps. And he's being tested by God. Verse 13 through the end of chapter 18 gives us the account of the king of Assyria marching down towards Hezekiah. Now Hezekiah was not a perfect man. Hezekiah in fact compromised and gave in and he sought an alliance with Egypt, with the Pharaoh of Egypt. And the king of Assyria found out about it and had to smack Hezekiah down a little bit. And he ordered Hezekiah to pay him a lot of money. And Hezekiah did. Because Hezekiah did not trust in God at this point. So Hezekiah was not a perfect man. There is no perfect man in scripture. I used to think Daniel in the Old Testament was perfect because it doesn't say anything that I'm aware of that Daniel did that was sinful. But the Bible says all have sin and fall short of the glory of God. So we know Daniel was in fact a sinful man. But he had incredible faith, incredible dependence on God as Hezekiah. And we all learn, right? We all learn through our experiences. We go through one experience, we fail. But God uses it to make us stronger. It's this beautiful thing when life's experience, right, intersect with the truth of Scripture. And then God does great things through that. Great, great th things through that. So the king of Assyria... I'm going to start with verse 20 and 18. Well, let me start with verse 19. And the Rabshakeh, who would be basically the field commander, for lack of a better explanation, says to them, this is the trio of men that Hezekiah had sent out to meet the Rabshakeh. And the Rabshakeh said to them, Say to Hezekiah, thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, on what do you rest this trust of yours? Do you think that mere words are strategy for power and war? In whom do you trust now that you have rebelled against me? Behold, you are now trusting in Egypt, that broken reed of a staff, which will pierce the hand of any man who leans on it, such as Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust in him. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and altars Hezekiah has removed, saying to Judah and to Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem? Come now, make a wager with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you are able on your part to set riders on them. How then can you repulse a single captain among the least of my master's servants when you trust in Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? It's just sheer mockery that this Rabshika is saying to the people of the southern kingdom. <clears throat> and he goes on to criticize the Lord God. And in verse 36 he says, But the people were silent and answered him not a word, for the king's command was, Do not answer him. Then Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shebna the secretary, and Joah the son of Asaph, the recorder, came to Hezekiah with their tors, to, clothes torn and told him the words of Rabshakeh. And chapter 19. As soon as the king Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. He sent Eliakim, who was over the household, and Shebna the secretary and the senior priest, covered with sackcloth to the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos. And a little footnote, because he was friends with Isaiah, I truly, truly believe that the godly influence in this young man's life, Hezekiah, remember he became king at the age of 25. And I said to myself as I was reading this, I said, well, his dad was one of the most vile, evilest kings in the southern history of Judah. Where did he get his godly influence from? Maybe his mom, very possible. Isaiah, Isaiah. Isaiah was a man of God, right? And they have this friendship. They have this friendship. 
They said to him, thus says Hezekiah, this day is a day of distress, of rebuke, of disgrace. Children have come to the point of birth, and there's no strength for them to come forth. It may be that the Lord your God heard all the words of the Rapshakeh, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to mock the living God, and with rebuke the word of the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, lift up your prayer for the remnant that is left. When the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, Isaiah says to them, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid because of the words that you have heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have reviled me. Behold, I will put a spirit in him so that he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land. And I will make him fall by the sword in his own land. This is the word from Isaiah back to King Hezekiah. God's in control. And here's the answer to that very prophet, prophetic statement from Isaiah. The Rapshika returned and found the king of Assyria fighting against Libna. For he heard that the king had left Lachish. Now the king heard concerning Terhachna, king of Cush. Behold, he is set out to fight against you. So the messengers again, so he sent messengers again to Hezekiah saying. Now this is basically my next point when we refer to the letter. So Hezekiah gets a letter and this is what it says. Thus you shall speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah. Do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you by promising that Jerusalem will not be given into the hands of the king of Assyria. Behold, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands, devoting them to destruction. And shall you be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered them, the nations that my fathers destroyed, Gozan, Haran, Rezpa, and the people of Eden who were in Telazar? Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, the king of the city of Sepharvayam, or the king of Hena, or the king of Iva? In other words, we've destroyed them all, Hezekiah, and we're coming after you. Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. I want to show you a picture of Hezekiah. This is just, I fell in love with this picture. King Hezekiah. My question is, where is he not looking? He's not looking at the letter. He spreads the letter that he got from the Assyrian commander. He spreads it out before the Lord. There's the letter. He's not looking at the letter. He's looking where? To God. He's looking up to God. His faith is really being tested in this scene. But he does the right thing. He goes to the house of God, right? Jesus says, my house shall be known as a house of what? A house of prayer. He goes up to pray to the living God. And he spreads out the letter. So look at your, um, your engagement zone. Thanks. So imagine the scene. Him and all of his people facing a mighty army. The engagement zone. Do you fall on your knees and utterly spread your family, your marriage, your health, your kids, job, finances, your neighbors, whatever specific circumstance, event or trial currently in your life before the Lord? Are you praying as Hezekiah did that these things might bring him glory? Pray that these things that we pray about would be God's things for his glory. I just love that scene. And I think of my kids. I think of the future. And every morning, and, 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 and I don't say this to pat myself on the back because I, I fail more often than I succeed. But when I do succeed, it's by the grace of Almighty God. I lay my family out in front of God. And I pray that you guys are doing that too with your families. Spread out your family before God. Our church move. We've been laying that out before God. 
you know, praise God. And we know God's got it all covered. God's got it all mapped out. God already knows where we're going to be in a month. He's, he knows where we're going to be in five years. He knows where this body will be in 20 years. Some of you will be in heaven by then. Praise God. Right? <laughs> but there are serious things that we all face every day, are there not? I think of Jeff. I think of Chad. Some of the officers that are facing what they face every day. Pray for those guys. Pray for their safety. Your business, your finances, whatever, whatever thing in your life that's dear to you. Man, lay them out before Almighty God. That picture just does something to me. It's not great quality per se, but here's the letter. Hey God, we, we, we can't win without you. This is impossible without you, God. We're on our knees, God, because we acknowledge that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and only you can intervene right now and save us. And we are your people, so save us. And this is what Hezekiah does. He lays the letter out before the Lord. It's an amazing, amazing scene. And Hezekiah prayed, verse 15 of chapter 19, before the Lord and said, listen carefully, underline this, O Lord, God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim. I kind of wonder if Isaiah told him about his vision. And Hezekiah has this image based on what, Heze what Isaiah told him. Isaiah chapter 6, right? When literally Isaiah got this glimpse of the throne of heaven. You are the God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. He's reminding himself that all those other kings from all those other nations that, that the king of Assyria marched through, they're fake gods, they're false gods. But you, you are the God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, and you have made heaven and earth. What a great reminder. God, incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see and hear the words of Shennacherib which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations in their lands and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they were destroyed. Well said, Hezekiah. So now, O Lord our God, save us, please, from, this, from his hand, that all the kingdom, kingdoms of earth may know that you, O Lord, are God alone. What a great prayer. What a great prayer. God gets all the credit. God gets all the glory. And then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Your prayer to me about Shennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. This is the word of the Lord has spoken concerning him. And then God basically says, I am going to remove this threat from you. I'm going to send the king of Assyria back to his home where ultimately he will die by the sword of who? Anybody know who killed Sennacherib? His own sons. Two of his sons killed him. Some, some, many years later, but he died just like God said he was going to die. And he gives Ezekiah some comfort to say in verse 29... This will be a sign for you. This year, eat what grows in itself. and the second year, what springs of the same. Then in the third year, sow and reap and plant vineyards and eat their fruit. And the surviving remnant of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant out of Mount Zion, a band of survivors. The zeal of the Lord will do this. Ultimately, after Hezekiah dies, his son Manasseh did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And ultimately, guys, what year did Babylon conquer the southern kingdom? Somebody yell it out loud. 605, in a stage of three separate deportations. 605, 597, and 586. I'm looking at Dawkins for confirmation there. In three stages of deportations, the southern kingdom gets deported by King who? Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king. So it's so important that we see that when we have the values and biblical values that a, that, a, that a nation can be exalted, but that when we exalt sin, God's when we're disobedient to God, ultimately we get God's discipline. God's discipline.
the last point I want to make today, I'm going to skip my third point, lack of time, because this last point is, is extremely important for you men. Hezekiah had a friend, and his friend was Isaiah. And in American culture today, many men have no friends. No friends. And I, I throw out an invitation because I meet with six different guys. Merrill, Brent, Pete Dine, David Blakesley. Say again? Bob Collicutt. Six guys every Thursday morning. Because I need men in my life. I need that friendship. Just like Hezekiah depended and was comforted by the words of his friend Hezek uh, Isaiah, how much more do I need it? And I know because a lot of men in our society do not have close friends, I'm urging you to make it a priority in your life to engage with other men in this body and meet with them on a regular weekly basis and study the Word of God together and get involved in each other's life. It has to happen, guys. My vision is that at Panera Bread, that there's a group of four here, and a group of four here, and a group of four here, and a group of four here. That's my vision. It's not important where it is. It could, could be in your house. I could care less where it is. The important thing is, is that you are engaging in this walk. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. So guys, if, if you already know this, and you haven't sought out these friendships, shame on you. Shame on you. You need it. I don't say that to, to, to get on your... Well, I do. I say it to get on your back. Yes, I do. Because it's very important. And obviously for women too. Women I think are a little more relational than men. They seem to have closer friendships than us guys do. So guys, if you're not, and if your work schedule prevents you from meeting early in the morning, and, and some of you guys I know that, but something still can be worked out. So I love that friendship because when Hezekiah was, was discouraged, he said, go get Isaiah. Go tell Isaiah. Well, I want to hear from Isaiah. And when I have a problem, I say, I want to hear from Merrill. I want to hear from David. I want to hear from Bob. I want to get their thoughts on this issue. It's a great thing to have godly men in our lives that can invest in and provide that type of counsel. So it's very late. My last point, I'm going to summarize in about 10 seconds. Genesis chapter 3, it's the remnant. It's the salvation is coming, but you'll have to wait. God saved the remnant. He saved the remnant through all this destruction and through all this discipline, he always saved the remnant. Genesis chapter 3 says, I'm going to provide you a Messiah right after the fall. It's the first gospel. In Genesis chapter 12, we know that this Messiah is going to come as a Jew in Genesis 12. Genesis 49, verse 10, it said that the Messiah will come from the tribe of Judah. The southern kingdom, Judah, right? The Davidic covenant, right? God tells David, your throne will last forever partially fulfilled in Solomon, his son, but ultimately culminating in the true fulfillment of who? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. And we, thankfully, as Christians today, are the ultimate remnant that God saved throughout all these pages of history. We are the remnant of God. And that's a really neat thing. So my apologies that I, I ran out of time. I'm terrible in time management. It's something I'm working on. So we're going to go into a time of communion. So if the um, couples can can get ready for that. Hezekiah, when he restored the temple, he understood the importance of proper worship with God, true worship of God, fulfilling the old commandment. And the Passover represents what we're going to celebrate now, this beautiful, beautiful foreshadowing, this beautiful shadow of Jesus Christ. And by His blood are we cleansed from our sin. One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible is 2 Corinthians 5, 20, 21. And it says, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin for us so that we might be the righteousness of God. That summarizes the gospel right there. The sinless Jesus became sin so that we might be the righteousness of God. It's nothing Nothing anybody here can do to earn the salvation that God offers. It's a matter of faith. Matter of faith. If anybody here has any questions about the message or about salvation, please speak to me or Pastor Doug or the elders or leaders of the church because that would make our day to share the love of God with you guys. All right, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. Father, I thank you for the examples you've given us in Scripture like Hezekiah. 
Father, a man who lived in a culture that was anything but godly. A culture, Lord, that hated the things of God. A culture that was violent against the things of God. And yet you rose up this man. Lord, you get the credit. I don't give the credit to Hezekiah. I give the credit to you. You strengthened him. By your grace and your mercy, Lord, you saved him from the king of Assyria. And subsequently the people. So Father, continue to raise up godly men in our culture. Godly women in our culture. I pray for the children of our body, Lord God. Father, how I love each and every one of them. Father, and I pray for them as they are raised in godly homes that the truth of Scripture would penetrate their hearts and their minds. And Father, that they would walk with you, that they would desire you above anything else, Lord, that they would know that your thoughts and your ways are far above the ways of man. So Father, give us all a desire to please you in all things. I thank you, Lord, for Jesus. I thank you for his death on the cross. I thank you for every Old Testament promise that pointed to Jesus Christ and for every fulfillment of those promises, Lord God. And I thank you for even the promises that have yet to be fulfilled, for we know that they will be. But thank you, Lord, for Jesus. Thank you for his sacrificial death. We acknowledged we deserve to be there. But you took our place. So thank you, in Jesus' name, amen.